Welcome to another episode of Frankly Speaking with Sandra D. Please note that this episode is part one of a two-part interview. This episode of Frankly Speaking with Sandra D is in memory of all those who perished in the 2010 Haiti earthquake. May God bless your souls and we shall never forget. Hello and welcome to another episode of Frankly Speaking with Sandra D. My name is Sandra Dorste and I am, I am so thrilled to have you join us today. And today I have with me a, um, someone who I find, uh, you know, um, inspiring. And of course, you know, I try to bring you the best of leadership and motivation and, um, you know, experienced, seasoned, quality guest so that you can learn from them. So I have with me ex-minister, current doctor, Mr. Jean-Francois Thomas, and for short, he is named Franco. So I thank you, um, Doctor, for coming on today and speaking to me and sharing your story with my audience. I will start now telling the audience a little bit about you. So I, you were born in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. You currently are in, in Haiti, and you were you were a um, you were you graduated from veterinary school. You also studied psychology, and you have had an interest in the environment since you were young, but I will tell, let you tell the story. Um, your experiences include, uh, you were um, chief of service for the Santé Animal, and you were also a project in charge of um, the pets. I'm trying to translate. So most of you know that I, I am a native French speaker, but sometimes when I have to translate, uh, it's a little difficult. So let me go ahead and you know and just say to he's a very well-rounded and um he is also an ex-minister of the environment if i'm not if i'm not wrong i believe he was the first minister of the environment after the earthquake in haiti and he currently lives in haiti with his wife and um son but he also has three additional beautiful children so I want you to help me welcome Dr. Franco Thomas. So Dr. Uh, Thomas, what has been your, of course, you know, I always talk to my guests about their journeys. It is supposed to be an inspirational um, experience for the viewers. So what has, what has been the journey for you that led you to this point in time? Your, what, tell me about right. your early years, your family, you know, and you know, what has brought you to now to be here with me? All right. As you said before, I was born in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, in a, what they call a military house because my father, like yours, he was a military at the National Palace and I was raised between the military people. And that really gave me kind of the temperament I have now. And also, and I was a very, very, I was a big fan of animal and nature. We usually spend vacation in Belader. Belader is a city in Haiti, in the Plateau Central, in the central part of the country. And I was always amazed, amazed by nature, the trees, beautiful trees. And my grandfather used to be an agriculture. So he used to go with me for you know plantation everything that would go with nature and i was raised appreciating the beauty of nature so i had always that feeling that nature had to be protected and when i talk about nature i'm talking about trees water and animals and uh, I always wanted, and since I was very young, I usually said to my father, I want to be military, veterinarian doctor, and a, nat a nature protector. These are the three things that I always, because I, since I loved animals, I loved the army, and I loved medicine and nature. So 
at the very last moment, I decided, you know, in the beginning, I started with psychology, human medicine, but that wasn't my purpose. I wanted to be a, med a veterinarian doctor. So I went, I studied veterinary medicine. Then I made a solid background formation in, uh, in, uh, with the Carabineros de Chile, which is a military formation for graduated people, like, you know, professional, like doctors, engineers. And also I joined the Ministry of Environment to make the combination of the three things. And I think I kind of reached my purpose. That's beautiful. I don't know if you are. So keep, let's keep going. And so you currently live in Haiti and you are a uh, veterinary doctor and you have a practice in Pétionville from what I understand. Exactly. I am a vet veterinarian doctor and I have my clinic, my practice in Pétionville. Uh, working every day there and uh, I spent three years without practicing that much since I went to the to politics and I was for three years the Ministry of Environment which affected a little bit my clinic but now I'm back to my clinic and I think I love it a bit better. I know because I know you you are um, <laughs> my my favorite my pet my childhood pet was your patient I at some point That's correct? That's that's right. That's right. Mickey. <laughs> Mickey. The love of my life. You Beautiful know, I've never, got, I've never gotten another pet because I loved him so much. He, the family loved him so much. We never had the heart to get another pe um, pet to replace him. So he still remains the family joy. But um, so thank you for that. And I know it's um, you know, we're gonna coming back to you know different topics. I mean, you just mentioned your father, who I knew was a very good friend of my father's. So I want to take you back to your family, your parents. So how did your family, your parents influence you? Uh, as I told you, a, 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 a man, an adult is a product of his past, the way he was raised. And since the only thing really I knew when I was very young, was the military structure. We were raised with a, uh, to tell you, I had in front of my door, a schedule of when to play, when to study, when to read, everything really? was written on my door. So my I goodness. couldn't be, I couldn't be at four doing something that wasn't described in the schedule that my father had put. So it really influenced me a lot to have strong discipline in what I'm doing. Truly. And I think I didn't like it before, but now really I love it. I love it. Before we used to, before I could go to the movies with my friends, I had to know a poem. How do they call it? A poesy. A, a po poem. I had to know, hmm. Exactly. I had to know one to tell to my father. And there was one from Victor Hugo, Ceux qui vivent, ce sont ceux qui luttent. The ones who live are the ones striking, fighting for a living. These are the real people who live their life. And I had to learn it. And I missed like three movies because I couldn't know it very well. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the way it took. But I think it gave me, it gave me a, a way of seeing life, that life is not easy life is a struggle life is beautiful as long as you are fighting when the minute in the, at the minute that you are not fighting to find something to struggle life doesn't have no meaning no, no meaning and that's when the depression anything comes because the goal of the man is to look for something Absolutely. and you must notice that you must notice that every time somebody has everything something weird like depression comes because you're not Absolutely. looking so i think the, the the way my father my parents raised me has helped me a lot through life to be a, a good medical veterinarian 
uh, with a solid military background and also a strong defender of environment. As a matter of fact, I was the head of the of the of the environmental watch team, and I did my job job with so much in power. What I said, you know, very strict. That that's why I became minister of environment because they used to know me to appreciate the way I. They would call me a bit makut. They would say his name is a makut. Makut <laughs> so was the military striker. They would say. Let me let me translate. <laughs> that what he just said about what they called him it's called it's it's you know it's like a, a the toned down version of a dictator because makuts are people in haiti well makut was a police and you know there's rumor to say when there's a makut person you there's no negotiation available so that's right because i grew up in a military household as well except I was the Makut to my father and he was a military. <laughs> and it's interesting because I was the test for my father and my, my mother, my siblings, as you know, um, doctor, were much more calmer. But I, on the other hand, I pushed my parents to the limit. So yes, I can relate to that word Makut because I think I was that <laughs> in my household. And the problem in Haiti now, is that they didn't understand very well what democracy means. Absolutely. They are trying to, they are trying to mix democracy with disorder. Absolutely. So whenever chaos. You, chaos. Exactly. So whenever you want your job to be done and people, you want people to respect your job, they will tell you a makut. Absolutely. They will say that you're a makut when you are doing your job. For example, Absolutely. if I, if I know, like in Forêt des Pins, which is one of the best oxygen reserves in Haiti, if I know that people should not go there to cut trees, I put the announcement, no cutting trees there. Mm -hmm. So, my God, if I find you with my background, it's not going to be easy for you because I'm going to take you and punish you. But, so, you know, you know we will not, get to that uh, as far as the challenges that you had exactly. in that leadership. Exactly. So, All let right, me so let's wait. So, I want to ask, so you, um, it, I, the, so it ties into the next question is, which is the greatest lesson you learned from your parents, you would say is discipline? Discipline and power to reach a goal. Never give up. And focus to learn stay for focus, your to stay exactly focused. and to stay focused and learn from mistakes. Do not keep crying about I did that mistake, I did that mistake. Like may, many people keep trying on the keep keep crying because mistake your mistake, you pay for your mistake and you learn from it from it not to repeat it. But never try to make other people pay for your mistake. You must pay yourself for your mistake, learn about it and keep going. That's exactly what they told me. That's why my father would punish you. You don't have a good grade, you punish. You're not going to the movies right? because you're going to pay for what you did. And that's it. And to me, it's still the rule. Make your mistake, pay for it, and learn, and do not do it again. So, you know, it's interesting when I tell people that my father was a military man, and they look at me like, so what happened to you? You are so... <laughs> You are so <laughs> unconventional. I've done everything opposite, except I did follow my my parents' guidance to uh, education. You know, so I want to talk to you about you know. So I talk on these shows of bits and pieces about my father, but I, you are the first person to actually have known my father. Why don't, can you um, tell me what role did he play in your life? as far as you know when because we you know you and i um reconnected in washington when you came to study in washington and so tell me about the relationship that maybe where you left haiti your father had a strong influence and you came to washington and you found my father what was that what was that experience like for you it was like a continuous system because you know I didn't leave Haiti to go to Washington as a free, as a free young man. My father told me 
you're going to go to Washington. I'm going to connect, connect you to Cecilio, Colonel Cecilio, which is my brother. Are you listening? I am. I can hear you, but I Hello? can't see you. The image will be coming back again. Okay, All right. good. It's, it came back. So, so my audience, father told this me. Is, this, is, this is the raw version of doing something with Haiti. So this is there's <laughs> joy in it. There's spontaneity in it. You know, there is unpredictability in it. But that's the joy of it because you can't control Haiti. So Haiti is Haiti. So let's just keep going. That's exactly. So we keep doing. We keep going. Yes. My father told me, you're going to go to Washington, but not as a free man. You're going to go, I'm going to connect you. You're going to report to Cecilio Dorsey, Colonel, and he's going to put you in contact with Martial Romulus. All right, so you're going to obey and do what they tell you to do. So I left Haiti as a cadet to go to Washington under the authority of my father's best brothers. So there was no big change, but that did, that did help me a lot in Washington also, of because course. even my friends in Washington would say, you look like a little soldier because you, you know, you do not, you do not drink, you do not smoke, you do not everything. So I was very, very strict, even in Washington. Really? So it did, it did help. It did help a lot. Even my way of dressing, I was always dressed like, you know, and I wasn't, I wasn't what they call a cool guy. You were not hip. And? You were not hip. <laughs> I'm so, this is such a good conversation. And I have to tell the audience that him and I, again, we became sort of partners in crime in Haiti because I was the um, veteran in Washington because I grew up there and here he comes. I was showing him to do things, showing him how to do things American style. So I was the Jasper who get, wanted to give up all anything Haitian, but I wanted, I was going to, con, you know, cor it was co it's corruption. I was going to corrupt you to become more <laughs> American. That's right. But you know, as a matter of fact, when I went to Washington and I find and I found you, Patrick, I felt like I wasn't away from home. I felt very, very good because you know, Patrick was like a brother to me also. You were like a little sister, <laughs> but a very, a very <laughs> rebellious. <laughs> a little sister, but a very because stubborn. And Patrick, very stubborn like little you, Patrick was so straight and so strict. And there I was, you know, and so this was the good old days. So we have to keep, we'll have to reminisce just on that time. But I want to get back to, um, you know, what, uh, what inspired you most in your life from those days, you know, you had the discipline, you know, you had role models, your father, my father, you know, um, and, and uh, you may have had teachers, but who was the most inspirational for you? At some point you had to say, this is the person that's gonna help me, um, sh you know, shape my, my vision for my future. Was there no, one particular person? No, that's definitely my father, definitely my father. Because I still can remember the moments that we had to spend like two, three hours together because he would talk to me about the reality of life, the social problems, everything that uh, should shape a young man for the future. And as a matter of fact, when I, was to, when I went to Washington, D.C., I really, I was ready for any kind of situation. The only, maybe that's not the subject, but the only thing I really was surprised in the United States, in Washington, was the color problem. Because I'm telling you, I came from a country 
where I didn't know exactly what color I was, if I was white, black. And when I, the, the, the only shock that I had over there is that in the school, many teachers would tell me, how can you be so educated? How can you look so white? Really? So you talked okay. about your teachers. Your teachers were stunned that they had you had you were so refined. The work is refined and cultured because you were exactly. a, someone from Haiti. And you know, it's interesting because back then Haiti was on top of the world. This is not That's even right. the Haiti of today. So Haiti was, this is the days where I was so proud of being Haitian because, That's you know, right. we had a strong economy. The dollar was equal to the Haitian dollar, right? So- Exactly, exactly. So, so you could, it's hard for you to understand why these people would be so shocked to see someone like you, at, you know, uh, achieve such great, uh, have such great achievements because of being a black person. Exactly. And it was like, they were amazed. They, they would to call me any meeting, everything that people come into the school and the, the dean would call me, Jean, come talk to them. He said, this is a student from Haiti. Look at the way he is. And it was like, they could not understand the country when I was coming, you know, a very small country, the color and the high level of education. And that's what I learned in the States. This was amazing for me because, you know, such a big country, such a developed country, you would not imagine that a problem that we in Haiti, we had overcome since so many years mm -hmm. that you would find the kind of problem the kind of you know so it was like i was saying no it's not the states because this problem they are talking about i don't know it in haiti we right. already passed it years absolutely. ago absolutely <laughs> i know exactly what you mean because even today people talk about these issues and i'm like i don't know that's not my story so i want to take you back <laughs> to um you know your father and you know uh how he led you so those principles of being sort of uh you know more into the character which is more like what Martin luther king talked about you know you know mm -hmm. you were being judged for the character not the color of your skin so this That's was right. all cultivated within your household someone like your father would have told you did you share this these experiences with your father at the time when you were that's right as a matter of fact he came to my school in washington mm -hmm. i was in i was on the at catholic university okay i started in, you know i finished at emerson school high school and i catholic i don't remember which one he went to and uh, he kept like he, he talked like 10 or 15 minutes to the dean mrs walsh she his name was and she didn't she didn't want to let him go <laughs> and after he went she said you are like prince you're like i don't know where are you coming from and well we are royalty and you look <laughs> we, we are royalty exactly. and that's royalty. when she told exactly exactly and that's when she told me something that i said to my father she said uh, man you look so white i said you no you don't right. look like white i say i look haitian that's the way we are we are very well educated I that's exactly so, that was my I'm answer so and i told happy. my <laughs> this is such a great and, conversation because you know it's because i you know I, I know my audience knows that most everyone on the show has been from a different culture and this is a multicultural platform but this is home to me. This conversation is from my heart. I'm, you're speaking my language, which is um, a way for the audience to know me because I tell people I'm from Haiti, but they don't really know my story, my background, because I don't talk about it. So this is very important that you say your experience as being oh, someone from Haiti who happens to be black, but have been told that you are white because of your educational level, because of your cultural background, and because of your refinement. 
and because of your fearlessness, because I think there is something about Haiti or Haitians, we are fearless in the face of diversity. If you come, you're from what Japan or China or, or, or Britain or France or United States, we treat you the same. There's no fear in us to say that there is some type of inequality. Is don't you think that's that's it, the way being from Haiti? It, that I feel that we have that advantage. Exactly, exactly. We had that, and uh, that also creates problems sometimes in the states among black people from Absolutely. Africa, like us. Every time when, you're talking, when you say black, you talk about black Americans, not Caribbean black yes. or African black, but black Americans, correct? Black American. Every time uh, some folks, black Americans, would tell me, Franco, let's go to a party tonight, a black party, like you know, like us. I would say, listen, I'm not going to any white party, and I'm not going to any black party. I'm going to a party. Absolutely. Because you know. I don't know what it is. And they would say, but you don't know who you are. I say, yes, I know who I am. But I, in my country, in my country, we do not have that kind of problem. So everything to say that we were way ahead of the system. Well, 200 years ahead. <laughs> yes. <laughs> years. Exactly. We are very fortunate. You know, we are very blessed to have that. So you exactly. had that experience and I want to take you back to, this is why, I, so I'm not going to put words in your mind, in your mouth, but I want to take you to your style of leadership. So early on, you were able to sort of identify some way of being in the world that would be more inclusive. So talk to us about how that experience or those type of experiences help shape your leadership style. A, that kind of experience you taught me to taught me that you have to focus of on human being. You have to focus on education. You have to focus on being a good human and ignore anything that could remind only appearance. So a It was like for me an example that even if you come from a small country, you're not a small person. And Absolutely. you have and you have to give good example and to know where you are going. That's why Haitian, anywhere they are in the world, they already they always reach the top. Always Absolutely. reach the top. Unfortunately. In Haiti, in Haiti, some you know, after we started having a democracy that we did not understand, the disorder started, and we started forgetting who we were, who we are, and we started acting, trying to imitate. Instead of being leaders, we started to imitate anything coming from abroad. And when you imitate, it's easier to imitate what's bad. Absolutely. It's easier. And because we focus I on, I think it, what happened, if, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I think it's because yeah. when we, our GDP started decreasing, our, you know, our, 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 our the, you know, the cap, the, um, the economy of the country suffered. So people started equating value with monetary value. Whereas value has nothing to do with the actual material value, but actual the inter inner value. Haitian had inner value and it was it showed outside. And now people are trying to gain material value to compensate for what is lacking inside, such as morality, such as you know, um, honesty, integrity, such as you know, vision and passion. But you know, I could go on and on because I am a daughter of Haiti and I, I, I'm observing it from the outside. So I want you to talk, continue talking about the leadership and how some, you know, you know, how that shaped, helped shape your style of leadership and what you see and um, what you're teaching your children now as far as future leaders. Okay. And uh, I, 
I spent like three years in the United States. And also, I have to say the good part, the very good part of it. I think every person should spend some time in the United States because it teaches you hard work. It teaches you discipline in working. Because we as Haitian, as in between Caribbean and Latin, we are kind of two fantasies. We like fantasy. We like uh, to, to enjoy life too much. And the passage in the United States really were, was very useful because in the States, you have to work and you have to struggle to reach some point. And I think it was very, very good. So all these experiences, experience, because I went right after I went to live with my father at the Dominican Republic, that's where I spent 11 years. But Did you spend that long it's in the Dominican Republic? 11 years? 11 years in the Dominican Republic because I, I started so, studying human medicine, then psychology, and then I finished with veterinary medicine and I stayed over there to practice. So I did some practice, like three or four years of practice over there. And then after I decided to go back to Haiti. So okay. the experience in the States was completely different to the one in the Dominican Republic. That in the Dominican Republic, there was no discipline at all. It was uh, you, you study if you want, but you would like to dance merengue instead. So oh, I came oh, from <laughs> <laughs> Bachata. So, which is my favorite what, type of dancing, by the way? Exactly. So, what I learned in Haiti, what I learned in the States, helped me a lot to know how to control me in the Dominican Republic. So, I would enjoy, I would dance, that's right, but I would know how, uh, when to stop dancing. Of course. Because the so problem in life the, is to dance. Balance. Yes, the problem in life is to dance, but know when to stop dancing. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So I'm exactly. sorry to start. I applaud you for doing that. I had some hard lessons, some hard lessons to learn. I think my parents actually gave up. They said there's there's nothing we can do to her. You know, my father <laughs> wanted me, you know, my father wanted me to go into the military. He told my mother this that that's the only hope for her. We're gonna put her in military school. <laughs> And me, can you, you know. imagine me in the military? I said to my father, I said, try me. My my siblings would look at me like, what is wrong with you? Why do you want to fight everyone and everything? Well, I knew I had a purpose. I knew that I was going to be different. I was going to do things differently. So you were, you know, you decided you were going to follow the the um the example of those your father and be very disciplined. But I want to ask you, um, was was he your inspiration for getting involved in politics? Uh, I am not, I am really not a very good politician. I don't like politics that much. I like discipline and I, I like the, I like military structures. But in small countries, it is always a mixture between the strong military structure and politics. Whenever they see somebody who has a strong discipline, military background, they say that would be a very good minister. Very good minister, very good minister of environment and everything. You know, you see how he struggles, you see how he's strict, and you see yourself as a military and you, all of a sudden, you are involved in politics but the education the strict the education the, the strong education military education, education that we receive help you a lot in politics because you know what to say and when to say it you do Absolutely. not talk too much and we we as people formed by the military we know exactly what to say and when to say it so because Yes. Go ahead. Yes, because uh, my father was always telling me, you 
you own the word you haven't said, but you are slave for life of what you say. My goodness, that's powerful. That is powerful. I wish I had spent more time with your father, but I was so busy out there partying, so I didn't have time to, to get you, all that. You were something different. I can remember that you wouldn't agree with anything that I would say. Everything you always say no you don't agree you don't agree i don't know why i didn't know what to do with you you never <laughs> agreed with anything <laughs> you know it's interesting because um you know my father was trained uh as a uh as a lawyer as well and yes. my, my my sister kept telling me you should go into the law, law because and i i didn't go into law but i did get a master's in conflict analysis and resolution I thought I could bring peace to the world, but um, I decided, you know, no, I think I'm, you, peace is when you actually want people to have opinions, but I'm, I'm that dictator that wants to tell people how to think. So I leave <laughs> people alone. But I want to touch, stay with, you know, what we're talking about as, you know, the politics, because, in, you know, in Haiti, um, you know, even though you're appointed to, minister, to be minister, you actually have a lot of political, um, political, how can I say, uh, experiences, meaning you have to advocate and, and sort of um, pr uh, present your case when you are working in that, in, in, in any department as a minister, unlike people who are in the United States, for instance, who are appointed, they just do, they become more administrators. But I think in Haiti, People, um, I, I do see ministers as politicians, not people who are elected, but still they are politicians. Did you feel that the world was getting too political for you? That's right. Uh, it was being too political for me. And the problem is that with politics is once, once you entered politics, even if you didn't want to or by fortune, but you will never be a non-politician. You will always be a politician because you already did, and they know you as a politician, so there is no escape. I'm a politician now because that's the way they see me. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was always pursue me, and, uh, and I assume it, I assume it. And uh, I am the kind of person, I don't fear to take responsibility for my country. If one day, I have, I have to be appointed as a politician, and I'm sure that there would be a great, a, a real possibility to be a good one and to do my job, I would do it. The only thing is that I learned that if you want to enter politics, you know, you have to analyze where you are entering and to see if you will be able to do your job. Many people, enter just to enter and when once they inside they said I, I didn't know i didn't no 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 so you have to know what you are gonna step in so right. it's something very interesting so i am willing to serve my country not only in politics in anything that could be useful for my country but i have to know what i'm doing how i'm doing it and to do it so good. there's a very those are very important leadership skills to have to the analytical to assess a situation. And you can tell that you have that military background in you because, you know, in Haiti, we have a military, but nobody, we've not, I don't think we've fought a war outside of Haiti. So, um, except, you know, what, when we came to help, you know, fight um, to abolish slavery and also lead revolutions to help other countries, but we never had to go uh, try to anyway let me not get into the history because i'm not an expert but what i want to say is you have that strategy in mind that in order for you to actually assess your your situation you have to think about the end what you're trying to achieve and that's that's pretty that's a very strong leadership skill assessment strategy to be able to predict sometimes what your opponent in in your case would be the opponent would be um sort of people who would resist your policies and resist your 
your your strategy. So I want to. I'm actually getting. I'm digressing because I want to talk more about the personal side. I want to talk about um, how do you re-energize? You know, when you're facing adversity, because you know, as a you came back to Haiti, and sometimes when people come back to a country, and I know that happened to my father, that happened to me when I after I left the UK and I came back to the US. You come back and you have to realign yourself with the country that you left to be part of that. So this could be an adversity that you face, but how do you re-energize re yourself when you feel so defeated and then you see that um, you know, you've know you given it, you're trying so hard, but things are not working out. How do you re-energize and stay focused? The first thing you do when you see a problem that you cannot solve you cannot face maybe at the right moment is to step back, step back and look at it. That's what we learn in military studies that uh, you have to face the enemy and see how strong the enemy is and be realistic. Can you fight it or can, do you have to turn around or do you have to negotiate? In Haiti, the disorder has been so strong that there is no way you can now destroy disorder. Like you say, I'm gonna, no. What you have to do in Haiti now is to be strict, but very intelligent, is redo the education. Re-educate people so you can create again that power that we had before. And uh, without education, you're not going nowhere. Force, strong force is not, is not the issue now because mm -hmm. you're going to end up in killing, putting too many people in jail and nothing else. So education, education is the basic, basic purpose now in Haiti. To protect, for example, the environment, that's why the army is very useful. As I know, I I want to get back to that and but you know that's you know I'm trying to because I really want to get to that and I don't want to miss the opportunity of speaking about your own personal your re-energizing what do you if I remember you played tennis correct you, do you still play tennis I played tennis but since I had some problem with my knee so I stopped since two years ago and now what i do is climb mountains not climbing i mean wow. like you know the walk i do walk fast in very high hills so to keep in shape but i stopped playing tennis because i did some uh, some bad stepping uh, once but okay. i keep i yes but i keep walking very high mountain like this morning Almost, I do it. We do it every Sunday, and How every day hours? I go for a good one. No, we are talking about uh, eleven kilometers, twelve kilometers. But I mean, like walking strong up hills. This is not very easy, and uh, that's why it keeps me in shape. Uh, oh my goodness, I'm impressed. Uh, so that's what I was referring to. Be energized is releasing that stress. To, exactly. um, to make sure that it doesn't stay stored in your body. So, because exactly. again, the, we talked about, you know, sort of the challenges, my goodness, that is phenomenal. I, I probably will go do maybe half an hour on um, the treadmill and call it a day. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm trying that's... to be more regimented. I do yoga, but um, that's another conversation. Yeah. So I want to, to, so how, you know, you have family, you have children. You, I, I believe you have a daughter who's studying in Spain. Is she still in Spain? No, like, uh, she did a master in Spain. Now she's working at the Dominican Republic. She works, she has a very good job in the Dominican Republic. As a matter of fact, I'm a father of four children. Yes. I have one, I have one daughter and three boys. Yes. And uh, three of them live in the Dominican Republic. And the last one, Tito, the one that you just saw, is mm -hmm. uh, living with me. His wife is Cuban. His, his mother is oh, Cuban. Yes, I was going to say, because he doesn't look old enough. Did they change the law? I was going to say, did they change the laws in Haiti for marriage? No. <laughs> no, because, you know, 
I, his mother is Cuban. His mother is Cuban. I think, and I don't know if it was good or bad, but I married three times. I got married three times. Did you, not, is it three not, times? I thought it was twice. Wow, no, it's it three was, times. It's three times. No, it's, it's not, a good not, thing. I, no, it's not that know, much. I, not I that wish much. Patrick had done that. Patrick, my <laughs> brother, you know, he was so committed to what? Anyway, that's another conversation for another day. <laughs> but I do believe in divorce. You know, I've never been married, but I said that, you know, I probably would have divorced like 10 times if I had. So I figured, you know, I'll save, uh, you know, the attorney fees. I would have to make, I would make too many attorneys rich. But, um... <laughs> So I decided, you know what, against my mother's will. And she says, you're sinning against God. You live with, anyway, that's another conversation. But um, so I, I definitely um, think that, you know, divorce is, but you're a Catholic man. So, uh, you know, divorce is against Catholic religion, if I understand correctly, right? You know, I don't really know what Catholic, what Catholics want. I don't really know what the, I was born Catholic. I, uh, in that aspect, I think I'm a bit like you. I'm always questioning uh, the, some beliefs, some religious, some religious beliefs. I do question them sometimes. I, I, I was born Catholic, but I used to ask a lot of questions about what is really a Catholic because uh, that's not exactly the conversation. The, but uh, speaking about Catholic, I was always give problem to the, I was, I was at St. Louis, St. Louis Gonzague. Of course, uh, the, best Catholic school school. In, the best school in Haiti. But I was always fighting with them when they talk about my roots. I'm a Catholic as long as you don't attack my roots. Mm -hmm. If you are saying Catholic is good, all right, okay, I'm Catholic. But whenever you start taking, talking about the tradition of my country, talking about uh, Rara, Voodoo, Gede, all these cultural manifestations, uh, whenever you stop, you start saying that they are bad, now I get offended. So I get offended because... <laughs> I want to talk to you. So this is um, very, um, you know, timely because I was going to ask you, do you follow any spiritual practice? No, not really. I am the kind, the kind of person I, I like to be with myself. The best retreat, the best, the best person you can talk to is to yourself. If mm -hmm. you are afraid of knowing yourself, you're a lost person. Many people are... Uh, afraid of being alone with themselves. And this is the end of your life when you are afraid of talking to yourself or seeing yourself as you are. But I respect a lot my roots. We as Haitian, we must remember that people came from abroad saying that their belief, their religion, Catholic, is the one who would save our soul, would take us to paradise. And in the meantime, they would tell you that whoever do not follow this will be tortured, will be hung, will be uh, punished strongly. So I always forever. say, forever. So I always say, but if you are the good person, Savior, and you tell me that if I practice my tradition, I will be head cut. So there is something, there is something wrong. There is something wrong. You must, you, there is a God for everyone. Because Indians that were living in the, our country before, they didn't know about the Bible. They didn't know about Catholic. They came with the Bible and told them, if you don't follow it, you will be hanging up on a tree. So, so I was that's, always questioning. So I was always question. questioning. Absolutely. Exactly. I was and, so afraid. I don't know about you, but I was so afraid of in Catholic school because I mean the thing. Of, of course, you know, I was never the type to agree with anything. So the nuns would say to me, 
you know, you're going to go to hell. And I would say, I would, couldn't sleep. You know, my parents were like, what was going on? Now I understand. I was so afraid because I was always thinking that because I was such a troubled child, not troubled in a back to someone who was not like my sister, very, very disciplined. I played a lot. I talked a lot. I was fun. I loved having fun. They said someone like me who likes to have fun is going to hell. So imagine as a child, I didn't understand that until I started forming my own thoughts and ideas about, well, I am a good person. I'm different, but I'm good. And I, you know, and of course there was always, you know, and this is frankly speaking with Sandra D, we talk about, you know, you have to, as a woman, you have to save yourself for marriage and you have to do this, you know, you, as a woman, and especially the pressure is more significant for a woman than it is for a man. And of course, I'm, you know, I've never married. So what does that mean? I mean, does that mean that save myself forever? I didn't want to be a nun. So it, it definitely puts the life of the fear of God in, in you. For me, I spent a lot of time thinking about, am I going to hell truly? And so I have not gone to hell. Hell is right here if you don't, if you don't change your ways. But I do believe that the, the Catholic Church is, is a fantastic organization. I was, I, you saw, I interviewed um, Father Marc Benoit, and we had a very candid conversation. They are humans like us, but we forget. We put, you know, the Catholic, uh, you know, church on a pedestal, and we make ourselves the sinners as though we are the broken ones That's that right. need saving. So I want to talk to you about, so back to the spiritual practice, do you um you talk about the Haitian voodoo religion? Is that something that you that resonates with you, or or do you have you had have you participated in any um, rituals? Or do you believe that there's value in that type of practice, which comes from uh, African ancestry? Listen, like you and many people of my generation, I have been raised in a strict Catholic structure. So you must do this and that, and you must be a good Catholic. But I, uh, I was always observing, studying, what is, what are really my roots? Because I, I, I was smart enough to notice that there was something else in me, in me that was also apart from Africa. So what was going on in Africa? We had tradition. We had voodoo, we had the other way of thinking. And I always said to myself, I have to respect it. I've never been practicing voodoo, but I always studied what was in it. And I also went many times to see the ritual, to see how it is. And I learned to respect it a lot because these are my roots and I learned to respect it. I always fought, fought with uh, many Catholic people, many priests, and uh, we fought in the way that I always respected them, but I said, all right, but do not ever try to make me think that the voodoo that helped us liberate ourselves, that helped us know that we don't have to be slave to go to this to the to the sky to the to the to the paradise to heaven. Mm -hmm. to heaven to heaven because normally for us the catholic structure would be you have to accept to be slave you have to accept it and if you are a good slave you will go to heaven i never believed in that and you can see that even in many parts, in, even in the Bible, I don't want to go too far in it, but they told you that uh, slave, if you, if your master is not a good one, but anyway, that you have to follow, you know, such and such. So there was something in me, like a revolutionary aspect in me that would put in the table, the two values, Catholic, good Catholic, but also I am Haitian. I came from somewhere, and these people are not that bad. As a matter of fact, if you compare the destruction that have been done 
in history, I believe that the dominant part did a lot more damages in humanity. This is something else as a strong subject that would maybe create a lot of talk, a lot of- This is subject. the show called <laughs> Frankly Speaking with Sandra D. And I wanna remind exactly. the audience that I have with me, ex-minister, Dr. Jean-Francois, Thomas, and those of you who know him as, as Franco, is frankly speaking with me. As you know, this is an opportunity for all the guests to be as honest and candid. The audience, we actually encourage that. So, you know, we, we know that the first um, Catholic emperor was um, Constantin. You know, my family was so Catholic. It was so um, Catholic. My grandfather, my father's father, was named his name was Constantin. So I can imagine, you can imagine the family I came from. But for me, I had to understand that I'm a spiritual being, that if I walked in into a Jewish temple, if I walked into a Buddhist temple, if I walked into a Hindu temple, if I, um, you know, if I walked in anywhere, I would feel welcome, not because of, of any doctrine or, or anything other than, you know, I, I love God as the creator of all and also creator of all the differences. And the so point. I didn't have to identify with one versus the other. I could just choose. So I, I like to call myself a pluralist. I do love the mm -hmm. Bible, but I love many other texts as well. I have That's to right. say that um, uh, the Haitian side of thing, the Haitian uh, spiritual uh, practice of voodoo, I am not as much familiar with it. You know, I didn't grow up in Haiti, thoughts. But when I do get go to Miami, there are friends of mine who subscribe to those practices, and I've been to a few. But I grew up being shamed because if you are from, you know, if you are, if you are. Um, uh, if you if you like this religion, you sh you you should be you're not a good Christian, you know. And one it does not interfere with the other. It's not my practice of choice, but there is value in it, and it works for some people. Clearly, it works, and it's also Franco. It's a healing system because for many many years, our ancestors didn't go to doctors. They would go and get healed by some of these leaders in the voodoo community right listen i like what you say because when i was minister of environment one of my best counselors were the uga the priest of voodoo because if you try to protect environment and you do not have information from the voodoo practitioner you're not you you you're not getting close to the solution because these people are the one who know exactly what kind of medicine you can get from any kind of plant in Haiti. This is fascinating. And we had even a structure, a team of a vodou, they call that they call them the Uga, that would tell us if I even had the television uh, activity with these people. At the beginning, people would say, but how can you invite a Uga? Are you crazy? You're a Catholic. You're, I said, I'm not a Catholic. I'm not a Voodooist. I'm an Haitian. And these people, they know how to treat a lot of diseases with plants. Absolutely. So, so my best friends in terms of environmental protection were also these Voodoo practitioners. So I, 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 I'm happy that you did mention that. Yeah, I'm very grateful. And for the audience, I want to translate what a Uga is. And it is a voodoo priest, voodoo priest. You know, it's interesting how, you know, the voodoo priestess, I've seen them wear white. I wear a lot of white. So people are probably thinking that, she, you know, I'm a voodoo, but I, I <laughs> you know, I'll tell you a story. When I was in, in junior high school, I came to the, to the US when I was 11 years old. And my mother, of course, was, was my father's wife representing Haiti. And one of the things that she had in the house when she did her presentations to the other wives of military attaches from different countries, she had these, these dolls from you know, Haitian art. One of them was like a voodoo doll with, with pins. So there was a child, uh, a, a classmate, who kept teasing me because I had an accent. And so I said to her, I have something for you. 
the next day, I took that voodoo doll to, <laughs> took the voodoo doll to class. And I said, you know, I'm from Haiti. And if you don't leave me alone, I'm going to stick pins into and you, you won't sleep ever again. I never had a problem with her again. That voodoo doll does nothing. <laughs> it was a voodoo doll for my mother's presentation. It had no powers whatsoever, but she believed it. She believed it and she left me alone. That, and you know, the, they had those dolls where they fill them with spice and it smells really good. And it's just for decor. But that American child had no idea what I was talking about. And she, she would see me and just walk, you know, walk on the other side. Yeah, so that voodoo doll worked for me that time. But I'm, I have to say that people cannot be afraid. They, they cannot be afraid. I was such a, a little rebel. Um, I, that, that you cannot be afraid of what you don't know. I, I encourage people who are not Haitians, you know, who are saying, well, this, these people are practicing voodoo. We are saying we are embracing our culture because That's our right. ancestors practiced this. This is what, when you heard, when you hear, and I will have another interview with, with Dr. Thomas about the revolution and how That's these right. people, came, our ancestors, what came about without barely any guns and defeated Napoleon's army. So that's Only. another conversation. That's right. You know, and so I'm a daughter of that land of those 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 um those that lineage that strong pure blood we are proud of that and nothing about when i say i'm haitian i embrace all of it i don't take part here part there it's all of it so i want to you know this has been a fantastic conversation you are taking me back to my roots so and it's you know and this is it's, it's extremely important for the future generations to understand and you have kids that you know this is not what mte mtv is going to um going to tell you about this is not what entertainment tonight is going to tell you about or cnn or for, in none of them you can learn from the elders in your community and embrace it this is what's going to make haiti stronger but i want to lead you back to now um so again thank you so much if you've been watching we will have we're having um now a sort of a, a sec a second segment please come back to the second part of this interview with dr ex-minister jean-francois thomas and my name is sandra dorsey i am the um founder of, and CEO of Sendor Capital as well, some of you may know. But today I'm talking about Haiti, my homeland, and I am, I've am i spoken to him about his journey, and I hope you were able to understand what led him up to this point. But I want to say that we will be um, recording a second segment and that will air the following week. So thank you for joining us. Please share, like, and subscribe to the channel and put your comments below. Thank you so much, and we'll be back. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Frankly Speaking with Sandra D. Stay tuned for next week's episode. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Frankly Speaking with Sandra D. on Sendor TV. Please subscribe to the channel so that you can be notified when a new episode is uploaded. Also follow us on Instagram and on Facebook, and we definitely appreciate you being part of this community.